and welcome back to For Book's Sake. I am Heather Roberts. I am Veronica Adams, and we are 1852 Media. And we're talking about more book banning today. Yes. Um, there's more lawsuits to talk about. Last time we talked about, um, what is it, in Can- Escambia can- yeah, County? Escamb- yeah, the, the Escambia little- County School Board case. Yes. Yes. There are other lawsuits to discuss. So there is yeah. some in Iowa. Um, but I'm not talking about those today. We're keep, we're staying in Florida. Well, I just want to say there's others that have popped up put, in my put search. A, put a pin in the Midwest. We'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back. Today we return Florida. to Florida. <laughs> yes. We're returning to Florida and we are talking about, because last time we were a little confused and maybe you were confused too, because there are so, there's been so many legal challenges that I couldn't tell, frankly, if these were the same legal challenges, if they were different, right? right? <clears throat> they are different. Okay. Yes, that one indeed. is, that one was against um, the county school board, yeah, I believe. School boards. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one is against the Florida State Board of Education. Totally different organization. Yes. So we go from Pensacola to probably Tallahassee is my best guess. Right. Yeah. So this case um, was filed in hold on the da, 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 go back up the u.s district court for the middle district of florida so oh yeah that is your that is your old stopping one, 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 one of those that the bottom one the bottom one right there folks middle district of florida okay <laughs> <laughs> for those of you watching on youtube so veronica may have some insight here probably not um, specifically <laughs> It has been assigned to Judge Carlos E. Mendoza. I do not know Judge Mendoza. I um, listen. I'm an I, I'm an Article Three lawyer as far as my yeah. experience in federal courts go. Right. So, yeah. It was filed um, on August 29th, twenty twenty four, uh-huh. and essentially nothing has happened in it right now. I mean, um, everyone's August to October. Heard. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's been served. At least it looks like almost it, everyone, if not almost everyone, has been served. Cool. Um, appearances have been entered on behalf of the defendants. Mm-hmm. And there has been a, um extension of time granted for either a defendant's motion to dismiss or their answer to be filed on or before December 20th. Pretty typical procedural stuff. Yeah. Pretty, pretty average, pretty normal. Um, it takes a little while to serve everyone. Yeah. There is a lot of defendants. Okay. So, and then there, there's a lot of plaintiffs as well, but the defendants specifically who have been, you know, uh, filed against in this case, my brain is not working this morning. I apologize, but it's, uh, everyone who's on the Florida state board of education in their official capacity yeah. as being as members part, of the board members of so it's individual defendants that they have to serve all of these individual defendants yes, in their official capacity. They will live all throughout the state probably. Um, yes. And require a myriad of process servers and who knows how much time to actually make sure service is executed properly on each one of them. Additionally, they've mm-hmm. also sued the Orange County School Board. All right. Also that's, Orla- in- that's Orlando. Okay. Also individually, individual defendants in their uh-huh. official capacity Got it. as members of the school board. Okay. So we have the Florida State Education. Oh, and also the Volusia County School Board. Daytona Beach, yeah. Yeah. So two school boards and the Florida State Board of Education are being okay. sued. That is a lot of individual defendants. Yes, it is. Which is why the service has taken as long as it has. Yeah. And it's taken a while, but ev- yes, everybody has an attorney. This is one of those cases that justifies the truncation rule in this, in the case heading, like the style of the case. Cause if you had to list out every single party, it would be like five pages of just the case. Oh, name. Yeah. 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 It's insane. Even in the complaint, the right. actual parties portion of the complaint, I was just like, scroll, scroll, scroll. <laughs> it is excessive. <laughs> it's excessive. All right. So the complaint itself is 94 pages long. Uh, well, but it so, sounds like a bunch of that's a recitation of like just the parties to make sure everybody's proper and, and 
A good bit of it. Uh, yeah. The, the factual allegations start on page 20 to give you an idea. Okay. Yeah. There you have it. 19 you pages have it. devoted to just listing the parties. Yes. Jurisdiction. And All shenanigans. right. Perfect. <laughs> uh, essentially their argument. And I personally think it's a good one. They are using um, free speech. That's their whole thing. I mean, There's, what, what better argument is there in a case like this? Right. There, it's a very simple argument in that the uh, school board and the Florida State Board of Education, school boards, I should say, and Florida yeah. State Board of Education are not properly following um, the rulings of Miller and its progeny from okay. the Supreme Court. The, the, the federal... United States Supreme Court line of cases on interpreting the First Amendment. With specifically uh, media publishing, all of right. that. Yeah. Right. And uh, that they've not, that the law does not uh, properly follow that and therefore it's unconstitutional Perfect. for so. the specific questions of, of issue here. So, so we've, um, we've been interpreting the First Amendment since the Supreme Court was, was first uh installed right we have this line of case law which uh, i mean you know depending on the respect for precedent you do or don't have um is the law of the land right and so the argument right. basically is just that florida has violated the first amendment and that case law yes brilliant simple yeah. straightforward very, very simple very straightforward awesome and uh yeah that they take issue with the fact, we talked about this a little bit last time in the other lawsuit, mm -hmm. that there is no process uh, in the law for evaluation, how long it has to take yeah. um, for an evaluation of this book, uh, what happens to the book, uh, you know, the process, you know, being put back on the shelves or being taken right. off the shelves. What is that process? What is the time frame there? And then also um, they take issue with the fact that there's no... Uh, definitions or any sort of process for who is the one that is going to be doing the taking of the books off the analysis and then putting them back or so or we have questions you. about like over breadth potentially and then also vagueness right like we yes. don't know how to like, there's just not enough information here for us to make a determination about who's supposed to do what or when any of this is supposed to happen correct so what is the Miller test? Some may be asking themselves. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Miller test outlines guidelines for, uh, you know, obscenity cases, yes. which is what this is. It's yes. an obscenity case. These, the, the books at question here have been basically red flagged for being obscene. For having sexual content within them. Right. Um, one of them, I think we brought this up last time and they bring this up in a lawsuit now that mm -hmm. one of the books was removed because it mentioned the term make love. And um, that, according to the plaintiffs, is just outside of the scope of what is appropriate under the Miller test. Because under the Miller test, you have to take the work as a whole into account. You yeah. can't just you know, cherry pick these terms and say, oh, well, because it has sexual content in it, it's overall bad. Yeah. Um, so the Miller test is three prongs. One, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. Say prurient interest five <sighs> times fast, by yes. the way. And Veronica, what does prurient mean? Uh, it means excessive interest in or relating to sex, sex or sexuality in an excessive way. It's yes. uh, overly sexual, excessively sexual, having or encouraging an excessive interest in sex. So Although the first prong... That yeah. in and of itself seems subjective to me, too, because... Depending it is on, a bit. I mean, you know, there's several factors that go into play. What really is excessive? Who gets to define that? So, right. That's a very good point. Um, the courts have tried to, but <laughs> yes, that's why we have all of this precedent to go and look right. at, right? right? So the first prong is talking about whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appeals to that type of interest, like overly sexualized. Interest. Overly sexual. Yeah. Yes. Excessively sexual. Yes. 
Number two is whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. Right. And then the third one, which is where a lot of the cards are being hung here, and frankly, they should be in my opinion, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So if the work taken as a whole has some type of serious literary value in this case, usually it would be literary. You could make the argument for artistic or political, I suppose. Well, certainly even scientific, scientific. Or even scientific. It was science in, books, in some, right? I mean, you know, I, I, it, it, it all just depends on what the book is about, right? So like right. if you've got an objection to a book about um, – members uh someone who identifies as trans and who is making a transition right like material related to the medical process of hormone process therapy and or gender affirming care of any kind arguably has scientific value does it not i mean correct right you may object to that scientific value but it still has some sort of Scientific serious value. scientific value there you go Correct. right so it doesn't necessarily have to be literary for books but literary is usually the, you know especially for non-fiction books right the yeah. the portion of oh, that I'm sorry for fiction books for fiction rather than for non-fiction fiction. yes yeah. yeah yes so for fiction rather than non-fiction it's right. usually literary interest yes which is why the cherry picking of the terms like make love and just banning a book based upon mm-hmm. that term alone yeah. is not appropriate because you have to take the work as a whole yes. to determine whether it's appropriate. Right. I mean, let's be honest. I am currently reading a series right now that taken on as a whole, <laughs> one, one could make the argument that this is not appropriate, right? For... Uh-huh especially for schools. Okay. For yeah. schools. Um, you know, it is 99% spice. I am not kidding. There is, I'm reading it because it's very popular and I need to know what's popular and why it's popular. Um, it is not my personal style of book that I like thoroughly enjoy, but it's not a bad book, right? It's, it's good. There's, there's some plot development it might be 1% plot, but it's there. It exists. Um, but if they were bringing that book forth in yes. this argument, like if it was in the library, which I guarantee it's not. Okay. But if it was in the library and they brought this book forth and said, should it be, you know, available for students, right. Right. you know, sure. Okay. We can have that conversation. I, I would may, maybe not, maybe we don't put that one in there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but for the most part, that's not what's happening. These books are more about, uh, they have actual literary value. They have plots. They have substance. They just also happen to have a couple of sex scenes. Yeah. Or sexuality right. in them in some way. Yeah. Or referencing sexuality in some way. Mm-hmm. Which is a part of the human experience. Yes. Well, that cannot be ignored. Depends on the human. You're right. But, I mean, even if... Even if you are asexual, Mm -hmm. being asexual is still a form of sexuality. And so perhaps having a book about being asexual would help you to, you know, work and understand your sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have sexuality and it doesn't mean that you're sexual and actively sexual. It just means that you have some type of sexuality. Right. at, At whatever varying degree that is or whatever whatever it is. I think (coughs) when you stop and consider, so the Supreme court has made no bones since the Miller test became a thing that it's, it's kind of imperfect case law and they're not particularly like married to it, but also there's never really been a case that has given them the facts that would lead them to develop a different test or just discard the Miller test as precedent. Right. Right. And it seems to me like situations like this are probably people in a certain cultural space seeking to 
move the culture in the direction, our, our, our national culture, American culture, the legal standards right. in, in a direction that they favor. So they are doing things like this in the hope that these state lawsuits or federal lawsuits end up in front of the Supreme Court for the purpose of getting rid of Miller and making right. First Amendment case law a little more favorable to banning books or to, you know, censoring content. Um, Correct. Yeah. And I should note that there is a line of cases that applies the Miller test mm -hmm. to specifically students. Right. That there's, well, of there's, course, because minors you know, is a totally different consideration than what right. adults can go out and consume in the free market, right? So Correct. So that, <clears throat> that has been taken into consideration here as well. Um, and they are applying that standard to the Florida law. Right. And the plaintiff's argument is that it's not up to snuff. And that it does it doesn't pass the the Miller test, right? And therefore, um, you can't. It, it's unconstitutional, right? And even if you apply extra sensitivity and or are extra rigorous in the analysis, because we're talking about children accessing these books in public schools and public school libraries, um, there's still not enough specificity in the law mm -hmm. and that it is overreaching and applying and being applied to books that it absolutely should not be applied to even you know so it's too vague and also too far reaching all at the same time right exactly and th their process is just uh it's not appropriate because what happens is somebody can anyone um can object to a book Sure. And that book, as they they remove a book within five days of receiving an objection, right? But then the issue is, ha what what happens to the book after that? Right. So, Where does it go? It just sits yeah. in purgatory indefinitely? Correct. And so m some books have been temporarily removed, quote unquote, from a library shelf for at least a year. So is that, so the Florida is saying, well, we're not banning books. They're, they're going through a process. Well, what's when the you, process when, when the, right. And when the actual outcome is that you can't go and obtain the book, is in it still banned? Yeah. You know, essentially you've banned it yeah. without actually banning it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's the argument here. Um, so it's it's very interesting, and I like what the publishers have done in this case because it is very straightforward mm -hmm. um, with their argument here. Uh, they have a you know a whole culture of fear section, <laughs> right, in their complaint, um, talking about the different uh, training materials and airing on the side of how it encourages media specialists to err on the side of caution. And that it could result in felony charges for educators right. with noncompliance and all of that, which yeah. then encourages more banning rather than actual critical review. Yeah. Yeah. So. Is it completely hostile to the people who are actually responsible for curating collections or maintaining classroom content and... <clears throat> <sighs> it's a wonder there are any public educators left in the state of Florida. It, truly, truly, because it, it really is a war on educators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's wild. So who are the plaintiffs here? We didn't really talk about that, but I feel right. like it's important to talk about the plaintiffs. So let me go back up here. We have Penguin Random House, Hatchet Book Group. Yep. Harper Collins. Macmillan Publishing, Simon and Schuster, <clears throat> All right, Source Books, punched in the face by the Big Five, and then some. Yeah, Source okay. Books. Okay. The Authors Guild. Hell yeah. And then some authors. We have Julia Alvarez, John Green, of Lori course, House. The, au the authors whose work have been repeatedly yes. challenged. I'm sure. Lori House Anderson, mm -hmm. Jody Pico. Of course. Angie Thomas. Um, and then Heidi Kellogg is um, a parent and next friend of RK. 
Okay. And Judith Ann Hayes is a parent and next friend of J.H. Sure. So you're going to have to have parties to the lawsuit where the book bans have actually adversely impacted someone. So we have students, the minors, who are protected by their by using their initials only and then who are parties to the lawsuit via their guardians in this case. Yes. The, the parents or guardians you just mentioned. So. And that's Children how have attempted stated. to access books and have been prohibited from doing so as a result of the law. Yes. Yeah. And if you see, so if you ever see that in a case and you're like, what does that mean? That just, yeah. it's protecting the minor's right. It's their parent or guardian mm-hmm. who is yeah. acting in their steed um, as part of the lawsuit. So let me go down and see if I can find some more um, in, interesting things from the the authors. Okay. So for example, Green's book, yeah. Looking for Alaska, <clears throat> excuse me, it was published by PRH, so okay. Penguin Random House. It's coming, for those who haven't read it, it's a coming of age story and teen romance about a boarding school student who gets bullied. I personally, I mean, I'll interject this. I hated that book. <laughs> Only because I hated the ending, okay? But you do you do enjoy John Green, though. Just I not really this like, particular yes. book. I really like John Green. This book, I mean, it's still a great book because it yeah. it in it, it evoked a, a visceral reaction from me. Yes. And if any book can evoke that type of reaction from me, right. it's a good book. Yeah. I personally did not like the ending. Okay. That's why I didn't like the book. It happens. But it happens. Um, but John Green is a fantastic writer. Okay. Yeah. It's a New York Times bestselling novel. It won the ALA's Michael L. Prince Award, was a finalist for a Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Right. You know, featured on top 10 best books for Yana Goodzolds, all these awards, right? Yeah. Um, It's been removed from school libraries uh, under the law's prohibition on content, the Florida law's prohibition on content that describes sexual conduct, in quotes. Uh, Looking for Alaska has been removed from school libraries in at least seven school districts in Florida since the law went into effect. So that's why he's in here yeah and then it goes through each author and the book that's at issue um pico's book jody pico uh the book at issue here is 19 minutes Mm -hmm. uh that centers on a school shooting and the demo the devastating ramifications um of of all that and uh that book which i mean you would think you should put in a school in the current climate, but okay. Uh, it's been removed from school libraries in at least 15 school districts in Florida since the law went into effect. Um, she has another book, Change of Heart, <laughs> that um, tells the story of character Shea Bourne, a death row prisoner who seeks to redeem himself by donating his heart post post execution to the sister of his victim who needs a heart transplant. Um, I've read that trope before. It's a very good trope. Yeah. Um, if done well, could be, you know, could be done very well. And uh, it's been rem- removed from at least two school districts. So, and it goes through different authors of, of multiple books. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so if you're interested, go and download this, uh, this complaint because they really wrote this complaint. Well, I have to say. Um, I think that this is better than some of the other complaints that I've read, <laughs> frankly. Well, there's an, uh, there's an art to pleading. Some people there really, really is. Some people are not so great at it. This is really clear and straightforward yeah. as far as complaints go. So, right. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we they are fighting the good fight. This is definitely one that we're going to be watching. For sure. Uh, I think we will talk about the Iowa ones next. Sounds good. Dive into that and talk about those book banning lawsuits yeah. that are happening. Um, mm-hmm. Because this is a really big deal. We're, we're no, putting we're putting so much time into these book banning lawsuits and talking to you about them because they are a big deal. Yeah. Um, and while it may seem like the same content over and over, that's fine. Um, it's the same but different. It, mm-hmm. It's necessary to talk about. Because this is happening across the United States. Right, right. And it's important that people see 
the the varying strategies involved <coughs> in these attempts <coughs> because uh, I mean <clears throat> you can come at this from so many different ways and and the goal is the same right to yeah prohibit the free exchange of ideas and to limit right. the access that that both children and in some cases adults have to specific ideas and information right which I mean, maybe something that we could debate morally and ethically, perhaps, but in terms of a a free and open society is really a non-negotiable. Truly. And yeah, I think Veronica makes a really good point. I mean, this is almost a roadmap, right? That we should look at how each of these places are approaching these issues and what's going to be successful and what's not going to be successful and that's important to note for other places that are thinking about, you know, going for yeah. this type of a, a challenge yeah. against a book ban. Absolutely. So if you don't know what's happening, uh, you know, you won't be able to repeat it or avoid that's it right. in the future. So yeah. you got to get informed and then go to a local school board meeting. Exactly. Exactly. And make sure that your school is, uh, mm-hmm putting books on the shelves and not taking them off. Yeah. Until next time, we will talk about more book banning. (laughs) This has been For Book's Sake.